Uh, hi everyone, uh, welcome to the data analysis and visualization with Python workshop. In this workshop, uh, we will be covering. Uh, okay, firstly, uh, let me uh, tell you uh, things about us, right? Who are we, right? So uh, I am Damien. Uh, I'm a year four tech four student studying uh, in Temasek Junior College under the integrated program. All right, uh, very friendly person. Uh, feel free to connect with me, all right? Uh, and then Eugene, do you want to introduce yourself? I, I'm uh, Eugene. I'm also a teen student at the Master JC and I'm a J1 student this year. Uh, and I like programming. Yeah, same. Okay, so uh, a general overview of um, this workshop, all right? So uh, first we'll um, go to a basic introduction about data analytics, uh, how it's used in uh, this modern world, in businesses and etc. And then uh, we'll be going into uh, various Python uh, libraries such as your NumPy, your uh, Pandas, uh, which these um, which, um, in which these modules are basically used to uh, manipulate data and find trends or patterns uh, between them, which we usually cannot see by uh, just by looking at the data set, right? And then um, after that, we'll be going into uh, data visualization. Uh, modules such as your Matplotlib and Seaborn, which will allow you to represent the data or the trend uh, and show it on a graph, basically, so that it's easier to view. Right? And uh, one uh, good thing about um, all these uh, libraries is that it is all open source, basically, meaning uh, it's open, it, all of these uh, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn uh, workshops are basically open source. Right? Yeah. And uh, at the end, we'll also do a bit of uh, machine learning which is uh, using scikit-learn, basically, right? Uh, yeah. OK, uh, but the main exciting task for today is that by the end of this workshop, you should be able to create a cheat sheet uh, at the end uh, for, with all the functions that they've taught you, uh, be it uh, Matplotlib, Seaborn, um, all the, all the, from all the libraries, basically. And uh, this cheat sheet will be able to, it can help you in your in the future, let's say uh, you want to go back to the, what you've learned from this workshop, you can just refer to the cheat sheet, and uh, after that you can just yeah apply that uh, function, and you basically know what it does. The cheat sheet, yeah. All right. So uh, this is an example of a cheat sheet. Uh, it is done. It is from um, uh, uh, it's from DataCamp basically. All right. So this is an Python V6 cheat sheet. Uh, so that, for example, if you never uh, lost a touch in Python or anything, right? You can just look at this cheat sheet and uh, based on that, you can just it gives you a refresh on all the uh, variables and uh, how to import stuff, how to selective import, etc. Yeah, and then uh, you can also uh, see your data types such as your list, strings, uh, NumPy arrays, uh, popular libraries used, right? Uh, yeah, such things. Right? Yeah, so. So okay, what is data analytics, right? So data analytics is basically the process of examining data sets, right? Uh, finding trends, draws, and, and drawing pa uh, the pattern from uh, conclusion and pattern from the information that those data sets contain. So this includes a range of tools and processes which uh, which is used to find uh, such patterns and solve uh, real world issues or uh, existing issues with uh, by using uh, these uh, trends and this data basically. Right, so data analytics is basically very important to uh, modern businesses and communities, right? Because firstly, uh, it, it it improves decision decision making, important decision making, such as uh, uh, which which would revolutionize businesses, such as uh, you can use the uh, data to see how well a company is doing, or uh, like basically just gauge on all the you know, basically find patterns up, right? So uh, this ultimately fosters business business growth. Yeah. Uh, okay. So some open source uh, Python libraries that we will be covering today is, as I uh, said before, NumPy, Pandas, which is used for data manipulation, and uh, data visualization modules such as Matplotlib and Seaborn. Notice that we separated it because data analytics is basically not only manipulating data, but it, it is also by uh, it is also visualizing them and presenting them in a presentable state, such that uh, if you want, if you have to present to a client or uh, anyone, you, it will be quite easy to understand. They do not have to look at the Python console and like, oh, okay, so uh, I can't. Uh, so because if they are not uh, very familiar with Python, they can't. Uh, it's a bit hard, you know. It's not uh, user friendly. It's not a uh, very nice way to present. So that's why we have uh, 
uh, modules such as Matplotlib and C1 to plot your graphs, uh, many different types of graphs there. Yeah. Okay, so uh, Eugene, we're going to talk about NumPy. So, uh, so uh, in this case, let's imagine a scenario where maybe say you want to you want to perform operations over a large list or array of numbers. I mean, you wouldn't want to iterate through the entire list because it is quite memory intensive, right? I mean, NumPy is also quite memory intensive, but it just makes it easier for you to do it. So this is where NumPy comes in. So NumPy, but before we get into the thing proper, you you have to install everything first. But for this workshop, we won't be uh, installing anything for now because we are going to use Google Collab, which has everything in sort of installed for you. So uh, if you do not have Python installed, just by install Python and probably a, ideally an integrated develop, development environment as well. And to install the NumPy module in, for Pandas, just run pip install NumPy in the bash terminal. This will install the NumPy package for you. And so since now that you since now that you have uh, downloaded this NumPy package, you can import the NumPy package into your Python uh, script to actually use using the same import NumPy as MP, where MP is actually the standard naming convention for NumPy that we use as shorthand because we do not want to like type, type, type out numpy dot array every time we use the function itself. It's a bit inconvenient, right? So that's a short way now. Right. Okay, so uh, I guess we kind of covered this earlier. Just import numpy as mp into your Python script to use it. So now you may wonder, what is what is numpy? Well, numpy is really just an open source Python library for you to do uh, mathematical operations over large arrays or matrices of numbers very easily and uh, the functions are very intuitive as well, so it's very user friendly. So uh, rather than just looping through the entire array or list of numbers by yourself, you can actually perform these mathematical operations using NumPy without actually having to write the entire code for iteration yourself. So big question then, how then do we use NumPy? We really have imported it. So the next step will actually to have, let's say you have a list of numbers, right? Uh, you can convert this list of numbers into a numpy array by using numpy.array where you insert the array as a parameter here. This will actually convert the array that you have into a numpy array. So uh, let's say I have an array that has the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4 and I actually put this array into the numpy.array function here. It will actually give me a numpy array that has well the elements 1, 2, 3 and 4 and you can use this array for different mathematical operations later on. So uh, Wait, oh, I hope, okay. That, that part, that side is misplaced, no, that side is always. But uh, other than that, you, there's also many other different ways you can initialize a numpy array. Where you can use numpy of zeros, where the main parameter will be actually a tuple that contains the rows and columns. Uh, this creates a numpy array that is full of zeros based on the rows and the columns that you specify. Similarly, numpy of ones also does the same thing, just that it, it fills the numpy array with ones instead. And numpy.md creates a numpy array that already has pre-assigned values inside. But how it actually works is similar to numpy.zeros and numpy.ones, where it creates a numpy array that is specified to your rows and columns that you specify in the tuple. You can also initialize a numpy array using the other other functions, numpy.arrange, where the key parameters here will be start, end, and step. Start meaning the number to start from, end meaning the number to end at. But Keep in mind this end is actually not inclusive. So let's say I, I specify the start as 0 and the end as 10. It will actually give you an array that is from 0 to 9, but not 10 because it's not inclusive. Step refers to like the interval between numbers. So let's say I I set the step to 2, it will actually go from 0 to 2 to 4 to 6, etc. etc. Uh yeah, also right. Uh, one thing to note is that the step is uh, basically optional. So uh if if you are not uh, if you didn't put the step function right or step parameter right. So uh, it will just uh, the default step is basically one. So uh, it will just give a um, give numbers from zero to let's say uh, your start is zero and n is ten, like what Eugene mentioned. It will be it will just give the numbers from zero all the way to nine because it's Python is non inclusive. NumPy is non inclusive. So the n is non inclusive. That's all. Uh, NumPy the full it, you have will have to specify a shape in the form of a double as well as a fill value. What this fill value actually is is that is the value that you use to fill the entire NumPy array with. So let's say we call a NumPy array with the shape 1,5, it will actually give you a NumPy array that is shape 1,5 with the whatever few value they specify. That sounds a bit 
not do this, but it will come, it will be very natural when the examples are shown later. Now by the full like is uh, similar to not by the full, but you have the fill value, but you actually follow the shape from a different array. So uh, let's say you have a separate array and you want to create I don't really know how to create this one. I'll just go to the example for this one. Yeah, we'll show you in the go. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the English is yeah, I mean. But okay, so in this case here I actually initialize the five by five array of zeros using half of zeros uh, with a tuple that contains five by five where one of the fives here is actually the rows and the other five is the columns. Similarly for another kind of ones, I actually initialize it with a tuple five comma five. It fills a five by five array with that's full of ones. Numpy dot empty is also similar. I I set the tuple here as five comma five. There will be five rows, five columns, and there will be a data type equals to code, and it will actually just give you uh, values inside the numpy array. So it, sometimes it works it works. similar to numpy dot one, sometimes it doesn't, but in this case it does. Um, but in this case here, I actually initialize array using numpy dot arrange. Which, uh, as you can see, here, start zero, stop is ten, and step is two. So meaning, it will start at zero and you stop at nine, where it will actually put the sort of put the number in at each interval of two. So you go from zero, two, four, six, and eight. But do keep in mind that this step thing is actually not necessary, and usually it will be default to one. But in this case, I included it here to show you guys. Um, now kind of four. Uh, I guess now it becomes a bit clearer. It's using a double, 5 comma 5, where there will be 5 rows and 5 columns, and it will be actually full, filled with the value of 5 because that's what I specified here. Uh, wait, so uh, the parameter here, right? So is that the first uh, parameter you uh, import, which is this 5, uh, represents the amount of rows you want in that uh, in the array, in the matrix, and then uh, the, the, the 5 on the, left, from the, on the right side uh, represents the columns, how many columns you want the data set of the matrix to basically have array, like, yeah. array yeah. Uh, this will be where the what I couldn't explain comes in. So uh, in this case here I have an array that has a shape of which I'm not it should be one comma five. Uh, where there is one row and five uh, columns because there is one, two, three, four and five. So uh, when I call number the full like A equals to array one, it will actually follow the shape, you copy the shape from the array one as 1,5 and it will fill the value with 3 which is what I specified here. So there is now actually an array that is full, there, there is 1 by 5, a shape of 1 by 5, 1 row, 5 columns that is filled with 3. So now that you have uh, initialized off the numpy array, you can actually uh, do a lot of functions with it. You can call numpy.mean to get the mean of the array, numpy.median to get the median of the array, numpy.standard std to get the standard division of the array, and many other functions plus, minus, divide, times power flow division and trigonometric functions it, it, it works re really well. Uh, so in this in this example here I call numpy dot mean with uh, I specify the array as array one. It actually gives me the mean of the array which is uh, five two over three. Yeah. And when I call numpy dot median array one it actually gives me the median which is five and so on. So uh, oh no oh no Okay, uh, uh, to, so to concatenate numpy arrays, it may sometimes be important to concatenate numpy arrays horizontally or vertically because they can have rows, different rows and columns. Uh, you can call numpy of each stack x and y, where x and y refer to two different arrays, but you need to make sure that the number of rows in these two arrays are actually the same to set those two arrays horizontally. Like, think of it as like you want to create a rectangle with two squares. They, they, to make sure that it happens, you, you must make sure that the height of the arrays are the same, aka the number of rows. So similarly, v stack x comma y, x comma y, x and y refer to two different arrays, and they actually set two arrays vertically. So, all right, stacking two squares horizontally, you actually think of it as stacking two boxes vertically, but you need to have actually the same number of columns, like same, same width, to actually like, stack those two together. So, I think this image actually summarizes it quite well. Uh, in the case of uh, number of H stack A comma C, it actually, in this case, uh, the array A has three rows, so does array C. So you can actually stack those two together. Similarly, for B stack A and B, A has four columns, B also has four columns, so you can actually vertically stack them together. 
uh, or more statistical functions, we can you can call that kind of percentile where you specify the Mickey arguments will be the array itself and uh, the array that you want to compute the percentiles from and the percentile or the list of percentiles you want to compute. And you do need to make sure that the percentiles you actually specify is between the range of 0 and 100 percent. Not say percent, but like 0 and 100, it signifies like the percentage you want. Now, by the quantile also works a very similar way. It requires an array to specify along with a quantile or a list of quantiles to actually compute the quantiles specified. Yeah. And these quantiles must be in the range of 0 and 1, so like 0 0.5, for example, 0 0.25, that kind. So, okay, uh, so we can also call uh, np.matmal, which stands for matrix multiplication, uh, to basically perform matrix multiplication over on uh, between two arrays, all right, two matrices. So, uh, in, so we have to call np.matmal, as shown here, right? Okay? Uh, so then let's say uh, we've got A, which is equals to np array of uh, this array basically, and then we've got B equals to np array uh, of, uh, which is a different array, okay, 5, 6, 7, right? And then uh, we call np dot matmal matrix, multi matrix multiplication, uh, and passing the parameters as the first array and the second array, the arrays which we want to multiply, uh, it will result in, a, uh, in, uh, in this array, which is basically the, um, the multiplication of the matrix multiplication of both of A times B, basically, right? Yeah, so uh, you can see this in this example over here, right? Where we uh, multiply A times B, right? Yeah, okay. So uh, for statistical analysis, we can also call uh, NP dot, uh, uh, we can also call an NP dot uh, correlational coefficient, right? So what this does is that it finds the correlational uh, coefficient, right? Uh, basically, what uh, correlational coefficient means is that it is basically the is basically measuring uh, the strength of a linear uh, relationship with its values uh, ranging from negative one uh, to one. All right, basically negative to a positive relationship. So if it's negative, it'll be a negative inverse relationship, and if it's positive, it'll be a positive relationship. Where if it gets close to one, it can be actually a stronger linear relationship between these two points. Yeah. And uh, one thing to note is that uh, both your arrays, your x, uh, your, let's say your first array and the second array which you're calling this function on, must have the same shape in order for this function to work, or it will result in a shape uh, error basically. Yeah. Uh, okay. uh, so, uh, two hours, uh, we only have two hours and we do want to have some exercises if you want to do them. So, we want to cover uh, the rest of the conference here. So, if you are interested, you can actually follow this link here to or to find out more about from the documentation itself. All right. Okay. Now that we've known uh, know about NumPy, basically uh, how uh, to handle NumPy arrays, call functions, and all that. Now let's go into a bit more uh, advanced like, into Pandas. All right. Which is a okay. So let's firstly let's imagine a scenario. Okay. Imagine a scenario where your boss basically asks you to get a data of uh, sales where the sales volume was very large, right? But then, along with the few other stats, but the thing is, the data set basically look like this, has a lot of rows, a lot of columns, oh my gosh, yes. But the, the thing is that in Excel, we usually when we are, when we are tasked with data manipulation, we use uh, tools such as Excel, right? Microsoft Excel. But the problem with Excel is that there are limits uh, with the amount of uh, rows or columns in which uh, a data set can be loaded in, right? Which is, uh, uh, in this case for Excel, is the limit of a million rows, right? And it's basically also too slow to identify uh, all of the columns or call, of, uh, let's say, uh, we want to carry out a, a function, let's say, uh, multiplication across this entire row. It'll be a bit slow, right? It'll have a bit of a delay if there's a lot of rows, yeah, columns also. So, uh, one way to solve this, right? How else can we do it? One way to solve this is that you can't just Firstly, you can't just sit and tell your boss like, oh my gosh, it's not possible, you know, you might, you might just get rejected or like, your boss will be angry on you, you know, this guy is incapable. No, you don't want that. You want your boss to feel good about it, right? Okay, so, that's where pandas comes in. Okay, pandas as in not these pandas, okay, yes, very cute, but not these pandas, but the Python module pandas, a very powerful library indeed, okay? So, firstly, let's know about pandas, right? background information. What is Pandas? Pandas is basically an open source library for data analysis in Python, okay? We know about NumPy arrays, but what if we want to deal with uh, n-dimensional arrays, maybe three-dimensional uh, arrays, uh, three-dimensional data sets, all these, right? 
That's where Pandas comes in. Pandas basically provides fast, flexible, and expressive data structures, okay? Uh, designed to make working with data sets very easy and uh, basically takes very less time, yeah? And uh, okay, you can also for, uh, you can also perform a series of operations uh, such as multiplication or finding the sum of all these arrays in a column or um, row or any basically uh, manipulate your data your data set uh, using pandas. It makes it's basically an Excel, but it's an open source version which is pandas. Yeah, and it's um, yeah okay. Let me tell you the adva advantages of using pandas over Excel. Okay, because maybe you're still you're still not convinced on why you would want to. Uh, switch from Excel to Pandas. Pandas is coding, uh, coding is boring, no, coding is fun, right? So, firstly, speed and scalability. Pandas basically handles your large data sets very efficiently uh, when compared to Excel. And uh, it also provides flexibility because Pandas provides very flexible and powerful data structures in which we'll explain uh, shortly, right? Uh, we also got integration with other tools. Pandas can basically, uh, okay, since Python is a programming language and there's like millions of uh, libraries available which you can use, you can use uh, uh, Python to, uh, libraries such as your Matplotlib and Seaborn to which not only we, uh, not, we can use Pandas to manipulate the data, but we can integrate such uh, the data we manipulated into uh, into basically uh, visualizing them uh, through uh, modules such as your Matplotlib and Seaborn, which is very convenient because you know if you're using Excel then. Uh, that we need to memorize, like, okay, uh, how do I create a graph in this Excel? Uh, okay, we have to go here, um, click, uh, okay, uh, make a graph, and then uh, maybe uh, enter the, uh, the statistical data of the graph so that you can plot out this uh, pie chart or uh, whatever for you, right? But in Pandas, not only can you do that, uh, sorry, in Python, not only can you do that, but you can also, after manipulating data with Pandas, you can also uh, customize your plot, customize your graphs, which we will, show, which we will be showing uh, shortly uh, in the data visualization. Sorry, and uh, one more thing, one strong point is that okay, so Excel, uh, Microsoft Excel is not free. Okay, it's costly, especially for businesses, business enterprises. Right, you need to. Uh, it's it's not it's not cheap. It doesn't come cheap. But Pandas is open source. It's free. It's completely free. You can use it. Uh, anyone can just download the package, pip install Pandas. We'll, we'll just show you in the short later and use this uh, amazing tool in order to manipulate your data because it does. It basically does the same things as your. Excel can perform all these functions, etc., but even better and faster. Okay, yeah. So it's very it's worth learning pandas. Yeah. But wait, hold on. Before we start, firstly, uh, we don't have pandas installed. Okay. But uh, for this workshop, uh, for uh, simplicity sake, we are not going to uh, install it in the terminal, right? But if you are interested in uh, coding on your own, uh, you can install your pandas on your laptop by uh running pip install pandas in uh if you're using windows you can use cmd or if you're using uh mac os you can maybe use uh go to your terminal and uh i think there's a function for that it should be in your documentation pandas documentation all right yeah uh, uh but for, for ease of installation you can just go to the bash terminal in your ID and just run pip install pandas to actually make it easier because uh in C command cmd i'm pretty sure about i'm pretty sure it will Input some other commands before pip install pandas for it to work. So yeah. Alright. Okay. So after installing the pandas package, uh, we can actually import it into our script by uh, running this command called import pandas as pd. Uh, similarly to how uh, we um, imported uh, numpy as np, right? We also have a standard naming convention for uh, pandas, which is uh, using pd, right? Which we use for shorthand. It's, uh, same reason because we do not want to. Uh, type pandas dot uh, uh, whatever function we are calling. Uh, it's it basically very uh, tedious, right? To so, uh, basically, how can I say? We can ease this process by using uh, p like a short, uh, shorter form. Short form, yeah. Okay. So all about pandas, right? Pandas basically has many functions for you to use. Very user friendly as well, right? And uh, for example, we can also uh, we can read CSV files, which is so, okay. If you're if you're a data analytics uh, job or anything, right? Uh, Data uh, uh, CSV files are very common. Okay, they are uh, they are basically files which contain all your data, uh, data sets, etc., and uh, can be read by software such as Excel too. Okay, the pandas also has a uh, CSV function, uh, a function to read CSV, which is pd dot read CSV, and inside the brackets, uh, you can specify the file path of where your file is. All right, in order to uh, 
uh, yeah, basically access the data set and imported it. Okay, so, so this, this is one method of how you uh, import a CSV file, right, which you already have. Uh, okay, so let's first, first of all, let's create this uh, variable called data frame, the df equals to pd dot read CSV, all right, where we pass in the file path here. Okay, for example, uh, in this sample data set, right, what we did is that uh, after we put the, the pd dot uh, read CSV, we put in the parameter, we just print the head of it, okay, which will be uh, getting shortly. What is how we just get the first five five rows okay? Okay, we will be getting there shortly. But basically, you can what uh, what you need to understand here is that uh, you can basically access the file using uh, pandas or read CSV, right? But okay, let's say you don't have the file as a CSV. You also have it as an Excel file, right? It's an Excel file because that's what many people use nowadays, right? So if you have it as an Excel file, then Excel file, yeah. You also have this. Uh, a function which is uh, pd dot read excel which not so basically you can not only read uh, csv files but you can also read excel files right uh yeah okay um uh, there are also like many other files you can read you can read dot json uh, dot pickle and i'm not wrong and many others if you want to so this actually makes it a lot more streamlined not streamlined but it makes it a lot easier for you because you can do it in one script itself yeah okay now now that uh, we imported the files, let's create uh, a data frame. Okay, this is the second method of uh, creating uh, a pandas data frame. So uh, apart from uh, uh, importing a CSV file or an Excel file or uh, an external data set, we can also uh, pass. Uh, we can also create our own data set from scratch. Okay. So how do we how we can do this is that for example we can uh, start off with a uh, dictionary. Okay. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Python dictionaries. Yeah. So, uh, for example, uh, let's say we have a dictionary called data equals to uh, passing the key as the theme, and then you've got your uh, list of uh, names here, which is Tom, Joseph, Chris, John, and then uh, there's another um, key here, which is age, and then you pass in the respective uh, ages of the of uh, these people, which is Tom, Joseph, Chris, and John. All right, and uh, if we put, and then uh, we can create this uh, data frame by passing in df equals to pd dot data frame spelled to entire name. And uh, since Python is pandas is uh, case sensitive, you might need you need to uh, capitalize the d and the f data frame and pass in data as the parameter. Or it basically, uh, it's basically the, the the dictionary which you which you specify here. In this case, data, right? And you will get something like. Something like this uh, image here, which is um, a data frame of your name and your age. Data frame as in uh, like a row, something like rows and columns. Yeah. So it's so, sort of similar to like an Excel type table with just rows and columns, just like a spreadsheet kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. So now that we've created a data frame, okay. Now, uh, what we can do here is that we can also access certain columns of data frames by calling df and specifying your column name here. Okay, so this what this does is returns you the rows of the data under that specific column. For example, uh, in this uh, example here, we uh, we put p the data frame and specify the data frame uh, column of status. Okay, and we print the head of this. So, like I mentioned before, okay, uh, what okay. What does this hit do? Dot hit uh, function. Basically, what this does is that it basically uh, prints the first five uh, rows of the data set. Okay. For example, if we print t, uh, okay, uh, let's say we are, we've, uh, print, we are printing this uh, df dot status, the, the status column of the data set, right? And if you call dot hit on it, it will basically just print uh, the first five columns that I mentioned. Yeah. In this example, you can see here. And uh, there's also an, uh, we can also use. Uh, there's also a function called df. Uh, you can put in your column name dot describe, and this function basically gives you the number of rows of data in each category, right? Uh, for example, okay, let's see. For example, here uh, we put in the data set df right previously, and if we call dot uh, df dot status, which is the column name. Notice that this uh, status is not in strings because when you put when you call the dot uh, function, you don't need to include the string the, the Call the name of the column in a string. You can just uh, call it call it here and uh, dot describe. And well, what this does is basically it just gives you the amount of uh, data under that column, which is uh, in this case two thousand eight hundred twenty three, and uh, how many unique values there are. So uh, Python basically uh, what you can do is that you can detect whether 
Uh, let's say, uh, for example, the majority of the data, of the data is like shift, 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 and you have some which is like a uh, error or something like that. What it, what this will do is that it will count it as a unique value, right? And uh, yeah, it will output here as six unique values. And for example, uh, and then you can also find the frequency which is like here, and uh, yeah, so it will also give you the data type object. Not yeah, frequency, but the frequency of the yeah, most occurring yeah. value in the actual column itself. So in this case, it's two six one seven. Yeah. Okay. So similar to describe, you can also call df dot column name, col uh, whatever column name you want dot value counts. Okay. So what this does is basically it gets the different unique values, right? And the number of these uh, unique, how many of those unique values there are in that specific column or yeah, in that column. For example, df of status of value counts, right, gives you the different values or uh, different unique values that it detects and also gives you the frequency, how many times it occurs. For example, shift, right, is uh, is the most is the majority uh, obviously, which is 2670 times, right, in that column, in that status column. And then you also have uh, uh, cancel, which is uh, 60, uh, 60 times in that column. Resolved, which has, uh, which has appeared 47 times, and the respective uh, yeah, um, data and the how many times it has appeared in that uh, specific column, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, there's also more functions such as accessing a certain, let's say you want to access that certain uh, uh, data type, that row instead of the entire column and uh, inputting function and uh, applying functions on the entire column, let's say, uh, for example, we can use, uh, okay, firstly, let's say you want to locate a specific data in that column, okay. What we can do here is that we can call df.loc uh, loc uh, and put, pass in the label. But also what this, this loc is basically, it stands for locate, all right. df.locate, uh, and then you pass in what data you want it to locate. And it will basically locate all the rows of data, all right. Instead of columns, instead of going by columns, we can go by rows, all right, in which it will locate the row of data under that label, which has that, the, the row which basically contains the label, and output all of the rows which satisfy the condition of having that label, right? And it also works with Boolean arrays, and which we'll show shortly here. Okay. Okay. So, uh, you can locate the rows of data under the label, uh, uh, okay, so, like I mentioned before, and we can also locate uh, certain, uh, certain data, rows of data, by by basically uh, uh, passing in the index of the row, uh, as index as in the coordinates. Let's say uh, I want the data on this uh, on the fourth row and uh, fifth uh, column of fifth column of the data set, and it'll basically output the row. Okay. Yeah. Actually, actually, not really x y. It depends on what your data set actually is, but you can just do like you can you can just if you want to just look at an entire row itself, you can just do like here to I log four. But do keep in mind that Python is a zero based index language, so we'll actually you look at the fifth row instead. The entirety of the fifth row instead. Okay. Alright, so in this case, we call uh, df.locate uh, zero, right? And what this does is that it basically it, it prints that row which is uh outputs that row which uh which is a corresponding row, uh, row with the label zero. Okay, so uh, it returns me with all the rows which has uh, the label zero in that which uh, you can see in the example on the right, right? Yeah. Okay, there's also more functions such as uh, df locate, like I mentioned before. But uh, okay, so in this in this in this scenario here, I'm actually doing df status equals equals cancel, where it's actually giving me a boolean array of uh, what of the different rows that actually satisfy this condition. So let's say the first row satisfies condition, you return true. Second row doesn't really satisfy, so it's false. And so on and so forth. So what the actually does because remember I said that it actually works with Boolean arrays. So what it does actually then uh, if it's true, it'll actually return it will return that row the, the row that is true and if it's not if it's false, it'll just not return it. So in this case it does return everything that is cancelled. Everything it says cancelled, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, there's also an alternative method to this, which is uh, the function of df query, right? So those doing SQL, you might uh, be familiar with this. Right, but uh, in Pandas, uh, there's this function called df uh, that, that dot query, right? Where you can insert the condition as a string. For example, uh, okay, for the previous example, we uh, found all the rows which has the cancel, right? Yeah, the cancel under their status column. We can put uh, df that query status equals equals to uh, 
uh, what's that called? Cancel, right? And then what that what what that does is that it basically outputs all your rows which uh, satisfy that condition, which uh, which is basically returning all the rows with with uh, status being cancelled. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. And in this case, uh, I called. Uh, okay. Let's say I want to find the price each. All right. All the columns we where the price each, which is is basically more than a certain value. In this case, ninety. So df of query uh, pass in the price each. But uh, it must be capitalized because uh, you know how like here on the on the this data set here, right? Is uh, all the columns are basically capitalized, right? You must Python's finder is very case sensitive. Pandas is case sensitive. You must ex, you must uh, put exactly input exactly the uh, let's say uh, the entire thing is caps, right? Then you must you must be at the entire uh, column should be also caps here, lah. If is uh, if it's not caps there, then it shouldn't be caps here. You basically, you must follow that. And then uh, for let's say if I want to uh, find out the values in which is more than ninety, what we can do here is that. Uh, for it, all the columns, columns in which your price each is more than ninety, and this gives the price of all the items in that column, uh, rather than that rows, all the rows in which your price is more than ninety. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now let's talk of uh, more functions. Right. Let's say uh, you want to calculate um, basically. Okay. I just want to aggregate the the, the different values over multiple functions, or just one function itself. And we call games of EDG where you have to specify the data frame. Uh, yeah, specify the data frame if it, or like the column itself that you want, as well as the list of functions that you want to actually aggregate by. So, what this does is actually just aggregates by the list of functions that you go and put there. For example, you can do another kind of sum, which we covered, which we covered earlier, another kind of mean, which we covered earlier. So, that actually computes you the aggregated values of. Data frame. So it just computes the mean, standard deviation, etc. If you go and put it in. So in this example here, I actually just call mean from. I don't know. You, you don't even need to put the data frame because it's DM or ADG. But the, uh, in this case, I just call DF price each sales. Basically, what this does is actually going to aggregate uh, the function mean over these two columns, which is price each and sales. So it will just compute me up the mean here. Okay. So. Uh, what we, what we saw here was basically uh, creating data sets and uh, importing CSV files which are basically cleaned for you. And most of the, in reality, most of the cases is not, it is which your data set is basically not clean. There are many, uh, let's say, uh, NAN values or uh, basically uh, your data set has a lot of uh, unclean things. Basically, when you run your, your code, right, you will output a lot of errors due to those uh, errors in that data set. And I'll be telling you more about those errors. Okay, what are such errors? Well, uh, in that uh, shortly right now, right? Yeah. Okay, so uh, one example is that uh, basically when, when you have your data set, right, uh, Excel tends to usually uh, save it as, uh, let's say, if there's nothing in that uh, specific column, sorry, in specific cell, it will save it as an NAN value, okay? But uh, in pandas, uh, what the, it will usually cause an error when you're, let's say, cause, uh, calling a multiplication on it. Uh, uh, multiplication. Uh, let's say you want to multiply all the values in this column with uh, maybe uh, whatever value you want, or you want to find the uh, the sum of all the values in this specific uh, row or column. Okay, and for that, what this what we can do is that to fix this issue, okay, we can call df dot is now uh, in the bracket and dot sum. So uh, what this does, it basically it doesn't okay, it doesn't fix the problem, but what it does is that. It returns all the number of any values in that in that uh, specific column. For example, uh, okay, let's say uh, we have all these columns, right? Okay, and then uh, we can see that all uh, the, so the sum of uh, is not what it, this does is okay. Uh, okay, can right? So all these everything is zero here because there is nothing. There's no uh, n a n values in all these uh, columns. But that if you can see here, uh, there are a few anomalies such as your address line, your state, and your territory columns, in which has 1,074, uh, uh, 1,486, and 2,521 uh, uh, things, basically, uh, uh, NAN values. So what this means is that, it basically means that that cell is empty and does not contain, uh, is, is an NAN value. But when, when we carry out functions of, uh, when we aggregate functions or uh, multiply or do any operations on it, we will cause an error because 
it, Python doesn't know what it is because it's not a data type, it's not an integer, it's not, uh, it, it doesn't know what it is, it's an NAN value, right? So for this, uh, well, how we can fix it is that, how we can fix this is that we can call this function called df dot drop n a right where we put the subset as the uh, the subset equals to the parameter subset is equals to the column name in which you want to eradicate all the NAN values and in place of that NAN value what you want to put right sorry in place of in place is not that. In place it's actually uh, if you want to actually edit the data the uh, data frame itself and it actually edit the actual data frame itself not the carbon copy of it yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah so Wait, okay, so sorry, uh, yeah, sorry for, uh, for, okay. So to clarify, right, what this does is that uh, it will drop that uh, basic that, that NAN value. We just delete that entire cell like, off the column, basically. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, of course, once that you manipulated your data frame, you want you need to save it, of course, right, in order to export it. So how to save this, right? But one way to save it, let's say you want to save it back to Excel file to send to your client, okay? You can uh, call df.2excel and specify the file path in which you want the uh, file to be saved in. And then uh, you can also uh, specify the sheet number for like uh, uh, where you want the, uh, like how many sheets you want, and then uh, missing data uh, REP, which what this does is that, uh, you know if you have uh, empty uh, cells or missing data in some uh, cells, right, of your data frame, uh, what you can do here is that, what, what it does is that uh, when, you, when you pass in this parameter, it will basically uh, be represented with, uh, those, those cells will be represented with N, A, N uh, rows. Yeah. So uh, there are more, much more functions, more uh, uh, capable, pandas has more capabilities uh, than this, but uh, due to our kind of constraint, we will be moving on to the other libraries, right? Yeah. If you guys want to do exercises, we do have some of them. We have prepared some. If you want to do them, if not, we can just skip them. It depends. Uh, do you have the, uh, the resources to the, the, the go collapse in, like which we showed before this? If so, maybe you can try some of the exercises. Yeah. If you don't have the, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, so let's pause here. Uh, now that we've covered uh, data manipulation, manipulating data, finding uh, the co-relational, co co uh, co uh, coefficient of the data frame or your sum, uh, carrying out functions uh, on that right mean of it or whatever, right? Uh, now, now what we can do here is that, uh, okay, so what are we missing? We have covered data manipulation, but we haven't covered how to present this data, this manipulated data, right? So how can we do this? How can we uh, visualize this data? That's where data visualization comes in. Okay, so I guess we will just be covering the problem first. So uh, we all know that data visualization is quite important to show trends, uh, just show me through your data. So actually, doing that in Python, you can just use that problem is actually very easy to use, it's very intuitive, just like most Python packages, because they're all quite high level. Uh, so what the problem here is here to help you. So it's really user friendly, just makes graph plotting in scripts very easily, very easy for you. You can just upload it somewhere that you need it to be. So for example here I call clearly a plot x and y, where x and y refer to two arrays with the same shape, it actually returns a list of lines that represent this plotted data based on x and y values. So yeah, it just has this graph here. As it's a very small, small graph here, but it, yeah. So uh, just covering the solution now, similar to just now what we covered for uh, pandas and numpy, you can just use pip install method inside the bash terminal inside your IDE. Uh, or you could do it in PowerShell as well, but that will be a bit more. Uh, it be a bit, a bit, a bit, bit more difficult. Uh.
All right, so I uh, realize that we'll be going a bit too fast, so there'll be a five minutes break, okay, uh, where you can maybe pace yourself. If you have any questions you can ask, feel free to ask us. Yep. Uh, yeah, there'll be a five minutes break.
And another example is that, so this is a bar graph. Let's go for a histogram now. When you, uh, when you uh, enter PLT.histogram and pass in your values, and you specify your bins, let's say you want 10 bins, right? Then you've got 10 uh, bars, basically. Like you count your 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? So it basically creates this many bars, right? Many, you know, this type of things. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. Okay. So, Let's say we want to plot a different type of plot, a scatter plot, right? Uh, which is in a way to, to show the distribution of data uh, over a plane, right? Okay. Okay. So. Okay. So how we can do this is that we can call this function called plt scatter, where you specify uh, a few random uh, values of x, uh, uh, basically your, what your x axis is and your y axis. So when you call this on a, let's say you, you want to plot the, you want to find the distribution of theta of a, uh, of a specific uh, column, columns of the theta frame. What you can do here is maybe, let's say, uh, okay, I want to find the, the number of sales uh, in these three days. So you can pass in the number of the, your, your days uh, column as your y-axis and uh, the number of sales uh, column as your x-axis. And this will basically show the distribution of theta uh, of your sales in these three days, right? And uh, now that we have plotted the graphs, okay, we may want we may, we may want to customize the uh, the grid, right? The, the whatever plot you have. So for this, uh, we can basically call uh, plt the grid visible. Or uh, and so what these these parameters and what these parameters does is basically uh, your visible your visible uh, uh, parameter hides your axis. And or it like shows the axis using Boolean. So if, let's say we pass in true or false. If we pass in true, then it will show the axis behind the, uh, the grid. And if you show false, you know, basically, you, you won't see all those like, okay, let's say you have your graph paper, right? You know how there are boxes behind that graph, that, that block, the axis. But if, let's say you do not want this, it's a bit annoying, then you can just pass in the parameter as false, visible equals false. And uh, you can also you can also use your your key uh, keyword uh, okay you know what these uh, K W A R G S what your keyword arguments mean is that you can pass in arguments uh, parameters such as your color line style and all these uh, other parameters to, to basically customize your problem all right so uh, okay uh, now that we've learned how to customize plots and uh, create graphs okay how do we limit uh, okay how do we uh, let's say I want this uh, graph to start from zero and twenty. All right. Or I want uh, my x-axis to start from yeah. X, my x-axis to start from fifteen and end at maybe thirty. So how can we do this? All right. This is where your uh, y limit or x limit function comes in. So what this does is that plt the y limit. Let's say I want to limit my y-axis to this range of values. You can call uh, plt the y limit. Pass in uh, which number you want or what's your bottom limit and your what's your upper limit. Let's say uh, I want uh, 20 to be my bottom limit, so my X, my Y axis starts from 20, and my upper limit to be maybe around uh, 50. So I want my Y axis to end at 50, right? So you have a range of 20 to 50, and uh, yeah, you basically get a plot with uh, where your Y axis starts from 50 and to 20, yeah. which, which is what you specify. So uh, for example, if I have a line plot that looks like this, right, and I want to uh, just Focus on a specific part of the graph. Okay, uh, zoom into that uh, part of the graph. You can call me only the y limit. All right. Uh, specify the values to be hundred. Okay, that's your minimum limit, and your maximum limit to be two hundred fifty. And uh, will result in okay. Uh, your y axis. Right. This is y limit. If you want to do that, the x limit. You can also call uh, plt your x limit, and the parameters are the same. Thing. Yeah. So uh, okay, as you can see here, your y axis starts from hundred and uh, ends at two hundred. 40, 250 is here, as uh, shown here, right? Uh, your minimum limits and your maximum limits, right? Yeah, uh, we can also use, uh, as mentioned before, PLT to X limit to limit your uh, right and left, basically. So let's say if I look at PLT to X limit 10 and uh, pass it 10 and 50, we'll start from 10 and end at uh, 50. Your maximum is 50 and your minimum is 10. Right, and uh, in this case, uh, 50 is uh, is one of the rare cases in which Python uh, 50 is also interesting. Yeah. Okay, so this will be very useful if you have anomalous data, such as your field machine learning models. You can see here your loss is going very down. Yeah, very elevated loss. Uh, if you're not, if you're not sure what loss everything is. Uh, don't worry, we'll be covering it later. 
And uh, okay, so uh, let's say I want to zoom into this specific part, right? Then we can use this PLT uh, Y limit. Let's say I want to limit the values of the range of Y to this specific range, so that I can zoom into that uh, into that uh, specific part of the graph. Then we can use it. For example, uh, okay, for example, sorry, but uh, for example, in this case, let's say I want to focus on this part right over here. Then I can limit my Y axis to maybe. Uh, Two and eight, and stretch out my uh, y axis a bit. Maybe I want my y axis to be from zero to uh, ten. Zero to twenty. In this case, then I can just stretch the graph and like basically sh show how, uh, basically zoom in and see how this data is represented. Yeah. So uh, these are some examples of plot that we use. Uh, you can also call labels. Uh, customize your plot by adding x label, y label. Uh, and which will, which will then uh, add labels in your y-axis and x-axis respectively, right? So uh, we can, uh, let's say we want to, uh, we have this data uh, set of flights dot CSV, and uh, we want to plot this, right? What we can do is that we can call it flights and uh, flights month. Okay, what this does is that it plots the month column of the flight CSV as your x, uh, as your, your x-axis, and, and it will uh, plot your passengers uh, column of your flights. Uh, data set in the y axis. And after that, you can also set labels for this, such as your PLT to x label, uh, passing it uh, as here, and uh, setting your y label, your y axis label, as passengers, and uh, PLT to show, to show the graph, display the graph. And there you go, you get your amazing graph over here. Right? Similarly, we can also uh, make a line plot right, here, in which uh, pass in x uh, axis uh, and the y, the here column of the flight CSV. And uh, as, as the x in the x column, so in the x axis, and uh, in your y axis, you pass in the passengers column of your flight CSV. Right? Of course, here you have to uh, uh, specify your data goes to flights to in order for uh, it to know which data you're referring to, which data set you're referring to, and your data show and show the spot. Which is, uh, show. Okay. So now that we've taught you how to plot the graphs, labeling them is important. So uh, we can see this uh, basically because I really told you about the X label and Y label. But we can, there's also many more uh, customizability, uh, customizing, customizing features that we can do. So one of such features is that the PLT dot label, sorry, the PLT dot title uh, function here, where we can specify the title of the graph, right? Uh, let's say I want the graph to be the graph of uh, X again, so Y against X or something like that. Right. Then we can, uh, yeah, we can just put it in as a string. We put it as a string in this like this parameter here, and you will basically set the title of the graph. And then let's say you want to display a legend, a scatter plot with different colored uh, circles or, uh, or uh, points, right? Then you can uh, make the title to show. Uh, let's say my orange uh, color represents this, and my blue color represents this, or whatnot, so that it's easier to understand for the person viewing it. Uh, to display graphs, we can show PLP dot show to show the graph. PLP dot figure to create a figure which uh, you can uh, maybe search. Uh, if you're interested, you can search up on the documentation because we don't have time, so we didn't cover the figure part yet. Because we have it not only can link uh, graphs, but can also create figures which is basically used in a uh, lot of machine learning also. Uh. And then we can also use PLP dot CLF, which is clear the figure. So uh, let's say we made a plot, you want to clear that plot, right? Then PLP dot clear will basically show the plot that you know. The plot, uh, and then you can plot another uh, graph then, which, uh, yeah. And then, uh, okay, after you make your graph, okay, let's say you want to save your uh, graph as, uh, as a JPEG file, right? Then you can call pld.save figure, all right, save thing, and then uh, in that uh, function, you can pass in your parameter as the file path in which you want the, uh, you want the, the file to be saved to. And yeah, so there's many more functions and if you're uh, interested, you can uh, go to this link in the documentation to find out more. Okay. Yeah, it's a JPEG image. Serious so JPEG image. Okay, so now let's go to C1. What's C1? C1 is basically a more advanced version of Matplotlib. So, uh, what, okay, so basically it's built on Matplotlib. It's a more advanced version, more customizability, with fewer lines of code. And it offers various statistical visualization options like your kernel, density estimation, or your all such functions, which is very useful for your exploratory data analysis, right? And uh, CMOS default visual style is basically more aesthetically pleasing uh, than your matplot is uh, one of these. So uh, what this, this means that you can create more nicer plots than your matplot is one. Uh, 
uh, if you like the code, and maybe even uh, good enough for it to be publicized to uh, other clients or companies or to, to show it to uh, customers. Yeah. Okay, so to install uh, uh, C1 in your library, uh, in your computer, we can copy and install C1 which in your CMD command uh, box, right? And this, and uh, after uh, you're done with that, you want to import it in your script. You can then call uh, import C1 as SNS, where SNS is the standard naming convention for C1. All right. So now let's make our first plot. Okay. Okay. So to make our first uh, plot, uh, okay, let's let's make a make, make let's make it a bit more interesting. Uh, maybe linear regression. Right. So what this does is basically predict uh, predicts the trend of your data. So based on that, you can see where your data is going. Like, uh, what, what you can predict your next data, your future data. So for this, uh, let's uh, assign this uh, PD dot uh, read work your CSV file. Okay, just import the CSV file uh, as uh, this variable called sales and uh, call SNS plot, REG plot, regression plot, where your X is specified as the months column and uh, Y is specified as the, of the sale, Y is specified as the sales column of this data set uh, called sales, which we imported right here, all right, using the pandas read CSV function. So uh, this way, what this does is that it basically uh, plot the regression plot of your of your months uh, your sales uh, in your y-axis and months in your x-axis, and based on this, you can see your current trend of your uh, sales. Uh, how your sales are doing? Maybe is it going well or going bad? Yeah, based on that. All right. So that uh, regression plot is one of the various plots offered by uh, C1. All right, and other such various plots uh, include SNS plot, pair plot, box plot, uh, cat plot, cat plot, and uh, all, all these uh, amazing plots in which. So, uh, all these plots, right, there's a lot of uh, different types of graphs, but what's important is that you need to choose, you need to be able to choose the right graph in order to visualize a certain data. Let's say you want to show a distribution of data over. Uh, yeah, so uh, in order to show, show the distribution of data over a uh, time or something, you use cat plot to. Or, or yeah, regression plot to really predict the trend of data. And there's a lot more, basically. Yeah, so these are visual representation of your C1 plots, your box plots, uh, LM plots, violent plots, pair plots, uh, KD plots, which show the, the, the concentration of your data and all this. Yeah. Okay, uh, there's also, uh, as mentioned before, SNS has a lot of customizability uh, features, right? And uh, some of this uh, includes. Uh, there's any the theme for the uh, for your graph. Okay, okay. so for example, uh, we can so some some of the themes right, uh, for the function of setting themes with SNS not set theme. And some some themes include dark red, white, red, dark, white. And you can basically uh, I mean these are very cliche games, right? But you can well you can you, you can just try them out and see your you pro, pro, uh, see which you prefer like, and use that theme. And then uh, there's also a, a different uh, parameter called context, which, uh, which you can which some of the context uh, parameters can be tabled in the poster. And uh, this basically changes the design of your graph. Right? You can try them out, but you, won't, you might not understand now, but once you try them out in exercises, you can understand better. Yeah. Okay, now let's have, let's have the practice now. Right? Uh, put into practice in, which, in what you've learned from the slides. Yeah. Uh, Okay. Oh. Okay. Uh, can you 